are lots of similarities. You know, to me, one of the biggest ones is that cheesemakers, like winemakers, start with the simplest palette of ingredients. They have milk yeah. and they have cultures and they have rennet, just yeah. like winemakers have grapes and yeast. Grape juice, fresh liquids yeah. that are going and, to be fermented. Yeah. What gives us such a range of taste experiences in the cheese world or the wine world are the decisions that the producer makes along the way to take it in one direction or another. And of course, with wine, there's a little more of that place element that comes into play, a little bit less so with most cheeses. But with cheese, it's more that the cheesemaker makes a million little decisions all along the way in that recipe that takes milk and cultures and a little bit of rennet and makes so many different kinds of cheese. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 105. What are the best wine and cheese pairings you've never heard of but should try? How can you make this holiday season more festive with cheese boards? Why are crackers and bread not necessarily great matches for cheese? Have you been serving cheeses the wrong way? Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> and should you eat rinds on cheeses? That's exactly what you'll discover in this episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm chatting with Janet Fletcher, a multiple award-winning author about wine, food, and especially cheese. We're talking about wine and cheese pairings for your holidays. This conversation took place on my Facebook Live video show several years ago, so please keep that in mind as the context for Janet's comments. You can find links to the wines and cheeses we tasted, the video version of this chat, where you can find me on Facebook Live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening, if you're listening to this podcast on the day it's published, and how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 105. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show, Miles and I put up the Christmas tree yesterday without our annual spat about the elegant blue and white lights versus the Las Vegas looking multicolor blinkers. Can you guess which ones I like? Anywho, we settled that last year. Blue and white on the tree. Outside, it's Las Vegas, baby. I felt festive, but um, also a little sad. My mother, who lives in Halifax, won't be able to join us this year. It's just too risky for her to travel to Ottawa, even though she is in good health. We're going to open our gifts on Zoom, but, you know, it's just not the same. But we have developed a closer relationship during the lockdown. We talk more frequently and openly about our feelings and what's going on in our lives. And for that, I am grateful. Okay, on with the show. The holidays are right around the corner. And I think one of the easiest ways to entertain is with wine and cheese, one of the easiest and most delicious, but... Which wines with which cheeses? Well, our guest who joins me live from Napa Valley is going to give us lots of super insider tips and pairings that we can try this holiday. Now, our guest this evening has written almost 30 books on the topic of food and beverage, and she's won many awards from James Beard to others for her work. She's written books like Cheese and Beer as well, and many other topics. She also runs the very popular website blog, Planet Cheese, and she joins me live from her home in Napa Valley now. Welcome, Janet Fletcher. Thanks, Natalie. Fun to be with you. Excellent. Perfect. So 
that was really high level, my intro. Fill in some details that I left out. Maybe tell us something that would surprise folks about yourself, whatever you wish. Well, wine and food and cheese and gardening are my life. Okay. <laughs> this is what I do for a living and it's what I do for pleasure. So I've just had the good fortune of being able to bridge the things I love most with my profession. And it's been just a really fun way to make a living for the last 30 years. <laughs> I write a lot about produce as well, about farms and farming and sustainable agriculture, okay. uh, especially in recent years. At Cheese, I would say over the last 15 years, it's become a kind of a subspecialty. And I think I'm more, more and more, more known for my cheese classes, my uh, Planet Cheese blog. Now, I still think of myself as a general food writer, but a lot of people, when they hear my name first, they think of cheese. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so Janet, when did you first realize that you wanted to write about cheese. What was it that drew you to cheese specifically uh, among all the other produce and wine and beer and so on? What was it about cheese? Well, what really happened is that, you know, as a food writer, a cookbook writer, cookbook author, I'm I'm always on the lookout for the next trend. You know, what's the next thing people are talking about that I might want to write about that captures my fancy? And it was maybe... 15 or 17 years ago that I started noticing that in the States, more and more restaurants were serving cheese. For so many years, they didn't. Or if they they did did serve cheese, it was really a half-hearted effort. Maybe they had a wheel of brie in the fridge and they would bring it out if somebody asked for cheese. And so consequently, nobody ever did ask for cheese (laughs) and restaurants just didn't serve it. I started to see more and more cheese plates, cheese cards coming into restaurants and More than that, I started to see that chefs were doing interesting things with cheese. They were adding a certain condiment or a special bread or using the cheese creatively in a salad or with a condiment. And so I started to think about the idea of a little book that I called The Cheese Course that helped people put cheese in the context of a course with something that kind of showed it off and merchandised it a little more so that people would want it. So that was my first book about cheese. It's still in print. And it led to my being asked to write a column for the San Francisco Chronicle, where I already was writing food pieces. But they said, why don't you do a cheese column? So that ran for about 10 years. And I just learned by writing. (laughs) So that was really my deep dive into culture and science and history of cheese and the people behind cheese which as an adult, I've always enjoyed. It's always been part of our table. Mm -hmm. And so going back to that first book, what suggestions did you have in there with pairing cheese with other foods to make it more of a course, so to speak? What were you suggesting that people do with cheese? Well, I would say, you know, these days I probably backed off of that a little bit more than I did back then. Then I was looking at trying to persuade people to have some cheese, you know, at the end of the meal. And if it took having a apple chutney on the plate with it or serving it with a homemade homemade walnut bread bread to make make you want to have it, then that's that's what what I was was, suggesting to people. These These days, honestly, honestly, Natalie, I I love love just cheese cheese by itself. itself. And at my my house, a cheese cheese course is is just going to be whatever's in the fridge, fridge, (laughs) brought out ahead of time so it's room temperature and served very simply, often with just bread or no bread. I know I love a little bit of honey with blue cheese but I'm also very happy just having the cheese all by itself. So, you know, I'd like for people to think that it's perfectly okay to make a cheese course out of just the cheese. Just the cheese. Well, yeah, and it sort of parallels the return to, hey, it's all about the good ingredients and they don't need to be dressed up. You know, they don't need to be over sauce, dressed, garnished, whatever. When you have great cheese and I would say great wine, that's all you need. I mean, it's just. Yeah, and the other issue for me with some of these condiments, which are beautiful on a plate, it's lovely to see the, the honeys and the pickles and chutneys and all that. But then they create a wine issue. <laughs> Once okay. you bring in something that's really sweet or really right. pickly, vinegary, you, right. you create a little more of a challenge for wine. Yes. So I'm also trying to show off a special wine, then I am probably going to avoid anything that's really sweet. Unless I'm going to serve a dessert wine, but otherwise I'm going to lean towards a more savory compliment for my cheese, like some roasted nuts. These days, it being November, we have a lot of new crop nuts around. So I'll like maybe just bring out some walnuts in the shell to have with the cheese. And those are good partners for dry wines. Absolutely. And I've always thought that even though you see the very cliche stock shot 
of cheese with grapes. It's like grapes are probably one of the worst combos you can have with wine because very few wines actually smell and taste like grapes. And then when compared to a grape, they start to taste bitter, the wines. Anyway, I guess that's just the old stock shot. (laughs) But I like your idea of savory. Would you carry that through to any sort of crackers or bread or like, do you tend toward like a rye or a deep flavored bread or cracker? Yeah, I'm actually not a big cracker enthusiast. I know people love crackers. It's a nice contrast, maybe with a soft or creamy cheese. But the thing about crackers is they usually have something on them like seeds or spices and they have fat in them. And you're already having it with something that's high in fat. Yes. So I just don't want a cracker with cheese for the most part. And That's frankly, I don't even usually eat bread with cheese unless it's a very soft, creamy, gooey thing that needs to be spread on something. I eat my cheese with a knife and a fork. Yeah. And if there's bread, it's usually a plain pan au levain type bread. My husband's an avid baker. So we have a lot of great homemade bread, you know, sourdough type. Walnut breads are really fun to have with blue cheese or mm. goat cheese. Sometimes I'll bring home a walnut bread or he'll make one, <laughs> but I don't use sweet breads. I don't hate sweet bread, but you know, it's not something I would think of with cheese, except maybe a blue. Okay. Like a raisin bread with a blue strikes me as a, kind of a nice idea. <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling the, <laughs> the virtual taste in my mouth already. So Janet, maybe you can Talk to us about maybe one of the more unusual cheese and wine pairings that you've ever experienced, whether you put it together or somebody else did and presented it to you. Well, I'll tell you about what I think is a real underappreciated wine and cheese pairing. I think I'm a big fan of sherry. sherry. And I think people don't drink enough sherry. Mm -hmm. It has a lot going for it. One thing being that it's very reasonably priced. Most sherries are. There are some super fine fine ones ones that are are pricey, but... Most sherries are very reasonably priced because they have elevated alcohol. You don't have to drink the whole bottle. You can cork it back up and put it back in your cellar and drink it over a period of weeks. Mm -hmm. And they come in a range of styles that all have something to offer cheese. With a lot of cheeses, I like the sherries that are just off dry, like Amontillado styles, Oloroso styles, and some of the dry Olorosos that are quite dry, but they're nutty. Yes. And they have a lot of body from the alcohol. They don't surprise me, but I think I surprise other people when mm-hmm. I bring out something like an Amontillado or an Oloroso sherry with the cheese course. People are either they're accustomed to having port with cheese or maybe a sauterne with a blue. But the idea of having an Oloroso or Amontillado sherry with cheeses is new to a lot of people. And I hope I make a lot of converts. Wine. Yeah. Sherry is a forgotten wine. It's sort of like grandma's wine or the old Dawn at Oxford wine. But seriously, like the, you know, the nuttiness, as you say, and just the more balanced, just a touch of sweetness, as opposed to the richness of port, which certainly, you know, is lovely, perhaps with a Stilton or whatever. But still, I think sherry is a greatly underappreciated wine, and you can get it for a great price, usually. And on this, in the same vein, the same kind of family of wines, is Madeira. Madeira, yes. Which, you know, who drinks Madeira? Yeah, we associate it with grandma or... Or you know, cooking, like, just for cooking. Yeah, oh, which yeah. is not the kind of Madeira you would want to drink. But a good rainwater Madeira mm. or a Verdeo Madeira, those are magnificent with cheeses that have a nutty quality, like mm. uh, an Alpine style, a Conte or a Gris or anything in that mm. you know, nutty Alpine style. And blues are just fabulous with Madeira. Right, because naturally a blue would go with walnuts. You were talking about that earlier. So Mm -hmm. why not have that nutty character in the wine as well? Mm -hmm. And the extra fortification, the extra alcohol, the extra bit of sweetness, that gives that richness to handle the creaminess, I would imagine, of the flavors and the stronger flavors of the cheese. So acknowledge some comments over here. Lise, I drink brandy with cheese. Any suggestions? Do you like any pairings between brandy and cheese, Janet? You know what comes to mind? is something like a really aged Gouda or Hauda, the Dutch. These Goudas get almost whiskey aromas when they're really aged, like a couple of years old. They get a butterscotchy, caramelly, and just a hint of that kind of peaty scotch smell. And I and they have a lot of concentration because they're aged. You know, they're two and three years old. So they've lost a lot of moisture. They're hard, they're dry, and they're very intense and 
you know, almost candy like. And I think a whiskey would be a great thing to have with them. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. You're making me hungry. So I'm sneaking some cheese. <laughs> Let's get into the pairings that you have. Now, I know you have a sparkler. So I've poured myself a sparkler. I've got Graham Beck from South Africa. Which one do you have? Well, I brought into my office. <laughs> I don't usually do this. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but Rotorer because this Excellent. is really my go-to sparkling wine, California produced. It is such uh, not only delicious, but it's yeah. really amazingly well priced. It is. Uh, it's half the price of a good champagne or less, and it's. I think a comparable quality, mm -hmm. just the plain Rotorer estate. So this, of course, is the in the same family as French Rotorer, owned by the same company yep. and made by the same standards, but with California. California grapes. And I just think it's a super buy, well-priced enough that it's not a special occasion beverage at our house. We have it a lot. And, you know, if you invest, invest, it cost almost nothing. And one of those champagne stoppers, a good yes. champagne stopper with yes. things, yep. you don't have to drink the whole bottle. No, they it's will true. Keep your bottle fresh for at least until the next day and sometimes the day after that. So oftentimes my husband and I will have a glass of sparkling wine over three nights from the same bottle. Yeah. And it's almost as good the third night as it was the first. Absolutely. And there's the preservative of the natural acidity of the wine and the bubbles and the effervescence. I think it all goes together. Rotor is one of my favorite. We get it pretty reasonably priced up here in Canada as well. It's usually just around the $30 mark for us. Of course, there's a currency difference there, but it's still entry-level champagne is 60 65 if you're lucky for us here. So you're taking the Rotorer. I'm going with the Graham Beck here. And what is the first cheese that you would like to pair with this sparkling wine? Well, the thing about sparkling wine, a dry sparkling wine, and there's room for some of the off-dry ones as well, but with the dry sparkling wines, I just find that for me, this is the desert island wine. If I can only have one yeah. for my cheese board, it can really go the distance. It can accompany a lot of different styles of cheese. I think first of all, people tend to think of sparkling wine with triple cream cheeses, which is a slam dunk because you have that rich fat layer of cream on your tongue and then the bubbles come along and, and scrub your tongue clean and you're ready for another bite. Oh, yes. So I brought in a cheese. It's not a triple cream but it's a double cream and the fat is elevated and it is a mixed milk cheese. It's cow, sheep, and goat hmm. from California, from my backyard, inspired, I would say, by uh, an Italian cheese that a lot of listeners may know called Latour, T-U-R, from Northern Italy. Okay. That's pretty easy to find these days. This one is modeled after Latour and it's called Talika, T-E-L-E-E-K-A. And it's from Marin County, California, West Marin, very bucolic landscape. And the owners of the creamery have the sheep and goats. They buy the cow's milk from just down the road. So this is not what we call a farmstead cheese where you, all the milk comes from your own farm. They do buy the cow's milk, but it's a lovely, luscious blend. It's got a soft rind, softer than a brie rind. Mm. And it is very fluffy, especially when it's nicely matured, it gets Kind of mushroom notes, but it has this oh, fluffy, fluffy, creamy cream. texture. It's oh, that sounds luscious. so good. Ooh. Luscious is the word for it. And you love, want those bubbles to come along behind and cleanse your palate. Oh, you are doing a marvelous job of making us thirsty and hungry. Now, what's the difference, Janet, between a triple and a double cream? And maybe I don't know if there are such things as single. Absolutely. Single. Well, okay. in France, there are actual legal definitions. Uh, Triple cream has to be 75% fat. A double cream has to be, I forget, I think it's like 62 or 65% fat. Okay. And then I would say kind of average cheeses are about 45% fat, 45 to 48. That's a law in France. Here, we don't have those laws, but I would say that most American cheesemakers are going to follow those guidelines. Mm -hmm. So if you see a triple cream cheese here, like Mount Tam from Calgary Creamery, one of our country's most popular triple creams, I'm quite sure that that cheese is a minimum of uh, 72 to 75% fat. Now, what you need to know is that mm -hmm. that measurement of fat is taken in what's called the dry matter. So it's if you took the cheese and took all the water out, okay, then you measure the fat in what's left. You know, but a lot of cheese is like a Mount Tam, it's half water. So by the time you add the water back in, <laughs> 
the real cheese is not 75% fat. It's more like half that. It's really more like 37% fat because the fat content is just measured in the dry part. Okay. So I don't want people to think they're close to eating a stick of butter, which is 82% fat. Good comparison. 75% okay. fat cheese. Yeah. That's the convention in the cheese world it's to measure the fat in the, it's called the dry matter. That's how we do it. And then a double cream is just, uh, you know, under that. And then we don't use the term single cream, but that would be a, a cheese that has not had cream added. So the only way you can get to a double cream or a triple cream is by adding some cream. In fact, I think I misspoke when I said Talika is a double cream because they don't add cream to that. They don't add cream to it. It just seems like it is. You can't take milk alone and get to a double cream or triple cream. Okay. Uh, you have to add cream. Add the fat. Okay. Yeah. There's some similarities with the wine world that I'm hearing. So, you know, with fortified uh, wines and you can't get to fortified without adding something, grape, must, sugar, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are lots of similarities. You know, to me, one of the biggest ones is that cheesemakers like winemakers start with the simplest palette of ingredients. They have milk yeah. and they have cultures and they have rennet oh. or something like rennet. Just like winemakers have grapes and a yeast. Grape juice, fresh liquids yeah. that are going and, to be fermented. Yep. What gives us such a range of taste experiences in the cheese world or the wine world are the decisions that the producer makes along the way to take it in one direction or another. And of course, with wine, there's a little more of that place element that comes into play, a little bit less so with most cheeses. But with cheese, it's more that the cheesemaker makes a million little decisions all along the way in that recipe that takes milk and cultures and a little bit of rennet and makes so many different kinds of cheese. Wow. Okay. So this pairing then works. We talked about the sort of scrubbing of the palate with the sparkling wine, the rich fat gets scrubbed away. What other cheeses do you have there? What's the next cheese, Janet? Well, this is a pairing that I think connoisseurs are familiar with, but maybe okay. others are a little surprised by it. Okay. And, and that's, that's a sparkling wine with Parmigiano Reggiano. Ah. I trying to remember where I first had that, but I think it was someone's home and they served it before dinner. It was just a chunk of parm on the kitchen counter and a Parmesan knife, which is a nice thing to have if you don't own one. A Parmigiano Reggiano knife is a blunt knife. Almost every kitchenware store is going to have it. The blade is short and it's got almost a heart shape okay. and it's blunt and you can chip off chunks of the cheese. And so you never want to slice wedge of Parmigiano Reggiano because Because you're going to ruin the crystallization. You're going to ruin the structure of it. Oh, really? Uh, So you don't saw at it with a knife? No, you don't saw, you don't slice it. You take a Parmigiano Reggiano knife and you make chunks. Okay. Make chunks. Like you wedge it out. Yeah, you just make little rocky wedges. Then people can experience that craggly and kind of rocky texture to it. Huh. But it is wonderful with sparkling wine before dinner or at the end of a meal on a cheese tray. Too many people. Well, I taught a cheese class yesterday and I asked people, how many of you have Parmigiano Reggiano in your fridge? And three quarters of the hands in the room went up. Everybody's got it for pasta right. to grate on pasta. But it's so much more than a grating cheese. It's an absolutely delicious table cheese just okay. to nibble on. Um, yeah. It's nutty and concentrated and super high in umami. And I like it. It's very nice with the Rotorer. Rotorer also makes a fancier cuvee called Hermitage. It's their vintage sparkling wine, and it's a little richer. And that is really sublime with Parmigiano Reggiano. I would say rather than a Blanc de Blanc, I would go with a sparkling wine that had a little more richness. More depth, maybe a, more of the presence of a red grape or yeah. the robustness. Um, perhaps some age, you know, the, a little bit of age on a sparkling wine can be a nice thing. And that would be a, you, when you start to get some more of those nutty aromas in sparkling wine, they're just great with Parmigiano Reggiano, which is so nutty. And what's different? What's happening with this pairing of the sparkling wine with the Parmesan? Versus the creamy cheese. This is a different pairing. Why is it working in this case? Same yeah, wine, the different cheese. Is more about a contrast of textures. Okay. Um, the creaminess on your palate versus the crisp, brisk bubbles. <laughs> yeah. It's a very pleasing contrast of textures. textures. The Parmigiano Reggiano, I think it maybe has a little bit to do with the salt. Okay. Uh, because parm is aged for two, you know, anywhere from one year on up, but mostly what you're going to see in the stores is probably about two years old. And they get more concentrated and the salt doesn't come up. The perception of salt comes up because you're losing moisture. The percentage of salt in the cheese is coming up and you perceive them just salty and 
highly savory. There's almost a saline note too in some sparkling wines, I think. It's the reason we like sparkling wine often with shellfish. Yes, they, that's there's true. just a little bit of that saline echo that yeah. I think is very pleasing. And also Parmigiano Reggiano would be a great moment to bring in an off dry or extra dry style of sparkling wine mm-hmm. where you're getting just a touch of sweetness. The rotor is extra dry, which I had, I think, for the first time yesterday is just Strength to my taste. You don't really perceive sweetness. You just know that it's it's a little more rounded, a little more mellow. You know, brisk acidity is softened up a little bit. We had it yesterday with Parmigiano Reggiano, and it was just lovely. Oh, you're making my <laughs> salivatory glands activate. Just great Me too, and it's much earlier here. <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead. All right. Are there other cheeses that you don't slice as well? Yeah, I think. Anytime you have a cheese that's really dry and brittle and got that kind of friable texture, it's not going to slice nicely anyway. Right. So it's nice to have yourself one of those parm knives so people can just break off chunks. I love that tip. When they get to three years, they have that same kind of, not quite as dry as a parm, but they're very friable. And so... They don't slice all that cleanly. So yeah, use a parm knife for those or you know, a more blunt knife and break off chunks. I know most people don't share this, but I like Pecorino Romano also as a table cheese when it's not super dry. Sure. Uh, it's sharp and sheepy and strong and, and that too, I'll just break off little chunks with a parm knife. There's even a wine called Pecorino from Northern Italy, yeah. very zippy, yeah. high acid, but uh-huh. I am getting myself a parm knife after this chat. I'm intrigued. Yeah, you don't have to invest a lot. Almost any cookware store will have an inexpensive one, but sure. I have, I'll show you. This was, yes. I bought myself a little treat. Okay. Um, oh, last look at that. So this is a parm knife. That's yeah, nice. It's a beautiful one. It's got a kind of, a, I don't know what this is. It's a stone handle. Ooh, I like it. And it's just elegant and lovely. I had to have it. (laughs) Yes, yes. You're making me covet that. Is it available online or did you get it? I don't know. I bought it in a small store in Healdsburg in Sonoma County. And I don't see any kind of brand on it. Uh, So I don't know who the manufacturer was. But they had all sorts of different shapes. I don't like people to feel like they have to fuss with cheese. But there are different knives that you can invest in if you want to go all out. People have probably seen that knife that has the holes in the blade. Right. It's a longer knife than the parm knife I just showed you. And it has like cutouts in the blade. Right. And that's useful for cutting soft cheeses like brie or camembert because then the paste doesn't stick. The paste is the term for the interior. It doesn't stick to the knife. So you can get a nice clean cut. So those are good. And then there's another classic shape for like Stilton. Mm -hmm. It's more of a paddle. It kind of looks like a shovel. <laughs> it doesn't have a curve to it. And it's just, you just use it to kind of slice off pieces of Stilton or Stilton-like <laughs> blues. Wow. So this is, it's just ceremony. It's just like in wine, you have different. Decanting. Well, and, and You know, people have different glasses for different wines. Yeah, yes, yeah. there are reasons for all of them, but you can certainly enjoy a, most wines out of just a standard 12 ounce wine glass. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And with the rind, I know there's certain rinds you cannot eat because they're wax or something, but with your brie, say, is that where the flavor is? Like I've heard lots of people go, I just like to chop off the rind, but are we missing something with that? Well, it depends who you ask. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I once went to a seminar that was led by a very well-known French affineur, somebody who's an expert at aging cheeses. Hmm. He was here in the States doing some workshop all around the country and that question came up and he said, oh, man, no, you never eat the rind. You know, the rind is just the package. Oh. And, oh, <laughs> I often eat the rind. Yeah. And I've seen other French people eat the rind. And the Italians eat the rind. It depends. You know, sometimes the rind is a very tasty part of the cheese. I think yeah. often with like washed rinds, like a, a Munster, Red Hawk from Calgary Creamery, these, these cheeses that are moist and usually kind of fleshy colored on the outside. Mm-hmm. They've been washed with rind. And they have a lot of bacteria growing on the outside, good bacteria. And the rind then is a wonderful part of the cheese. A Reblochon or a Taleggio, for example, would be in this category of washed rind cheeses that have these wet kind of salty rinds. And I love that crunch that you get when you eat that rind. I would never cut it away. 
a brie camembert style cheese. I might cut it away if it seems strong, but I'm going to try it and uh, see if it's enhancing the cheese or if it's maybe getting kind of ammoniated, in which case I'll cut it away. And then some of the really hard rinds, they won't hurt you to eat them. There's nothing on them that's harmful, but they... They're just not that pleasant. They're hard. And I sure. uh, don't add to the cheese's you know, aesthetic appeal. So in that case, I'm going to cut, cut the rind away. Bottom line, Natalie, is that you should do what tastes good to you. Yeah. And if the yes. rind is adding to your pleasure in the cheese, it's perfectly okay. It's perfectly acceptable to eat the rind. And if you find that it's detracting from your pleasure in the cheese, it's perfectly okay to cut it away. Well, that's good advice for wine as well. <laughs> Cut it yes. away if you don't like it. <laughs> exactly. And I don't know if this is just fanciful, but I've heard like the cheese that's close to the rind. I don't know if it's just in creamy cheeses is like the meat that's close to the bone. It's the most flavorful. It's developed all these flavor. Is it at all in comparison to the juicy meat, the tender meat that's close to the bone? That's a great analogy. And I've never, I'm going to use that. I like that. Uh, It's a really good analogy because yes, typically paste, the inside of the cheese that's right up by the rind is the most flavorful, the most developed. Also maybe the most salty because that's where everything is leaving from. All the moisture is evaporating out, rind, and all the changes are happening or with most styles of cheese, the changes are happening from the outside in. So the center is going to be a little different taste experience than the cheese just under the rind, which is why when I cut cheese for people, if I am, say, making a serving a cheese course to guests and I want to plate it up first so that everybody gets their own plate, and I do this in my classes as well, I try to make sure that everybody has a piece of the rind and a piece of the heart because they're different experiences. So when you're going to cut a piece of cheese, for yourself or for others, think about how can I cut this cheese so that I and everybody else gets an equivalent experience and Hmm. experiences all the parts of the cheese, the center towards and then towards the rind. I don't cut rinds away before I serve to my guests. I try to leave a piece of the rind intact for everybody. It's part of the beauty of the cheese. Yeah, it is. Janet, what's your third cheese there that you have with this sparkling wine? Well, I brought in a blue. Excellent. Why <laughs> uh, not? Which, you know, that too, I think, kind of surprises people. They don't okay. often go in that direction. They think of blue cheese and sweet wine. But I brought in a mellow blue that mm. I think a sparkling wine can handle. You know, blues too tend to have a little bit of elevated salt, like that Parmigiano Reggiano. And I think the sparkling wine speaks to that salt. This is a blue from Oregon, mm. one of the country's finest blue producers, Rogue Creamery in Oregon. They are known for their blues. And this one is, I think it's the only mixed milk blue they make. It's cow and goat, and it's called Echo Mountain. Echo Mountain Blue from Rogue. And I like it with sparkling wine because it's not too robust. It's got a kind of a buttermilky note to it but it's buttery. It's not really sharp or peppery or pecant. Those are the blues that I might stay away from unless I was having a sweet sparkling wine, but you want, you want a blue that's buttery. Buttery and creamy. Yeah. Yeah. Like a Stilton from Vermont. We have the Bailey Hazen blue from Jasper Hill. That's also in that same buttery nutty category. Oh, let's see what else would, there are some from Northern Italy that are quite buttery from France, Fourme d'Ambert. A very mellow blue, uh, Bleu d'Auvergne, that's a pretty mellow blue. Mm-hmm. And these, they're just a nice taste experience with sparkling wine. You know, most people don't serve just one cheese uh, sure. when they have a cheese course. They serve an assortment of cheeses. And it's nice to have a range of cheeses on your board. Mm-hmm. So many people like to end with the blue. So I think if you're going to have a sparkling wine with your cheese course and you want to have a blue, look for that nutty, mellow flavor profile, not a really spicy Roquefort. Love Roquefort, but it's not going to work. It's too peppery and spicy and yeah. just attention grabbing on its own. It needs a dessert wine or not a Roquefort, not a Gorgonzola. Again, that's just too big and pungent and it needs right. a dessert wine. Absolutely. And we have some great cheeses here in both Ontario and Quebec. that are creamy and blue and made in different monasteries that have a long tradition of making cheese. And I just find that creaminess in conjunction with the 
tanginess and saltiness of the blue element is just wonderful. Jim Clark, how many cheese selections might be best? I guess it depends on the size of your party, but let's just say you're having a dinner party, Janet, for 10 people. How many cheeses would you set out? I'm probably going to serve three. I always like to serve an odd number. It's just kind of a aesthetic (laughs) choice to have an odd number. And five just seems to be a little too much. It kind of brings the dinner party to a halt. (laughs) And the two four comes out and nobody can remember what's what. And so I usually either do three. Sometimes I actually do just serve a single beautiful piece of cheese. Just if I find something that's special at my cheese market, I might just say, give me a big, beautiful piece of that. And uh, we'll just have one cheese. And that's That's the focus of the dessert course. Especially with the blue, I might make a dessert out of it by taking um, some nuts. I love to do this at this time of year in the winter. I'll take uh, several different kinds of nuts, like almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts, toast them separately because they take different times to get done and then put them together and fold them into honey. Uh, honey that is spoonable that I've warmed a little bit so I can uh, it's spoonable and I'll stir those nuts into the honey and then use that as a condiment for the blue cheese nice piece of bread a dessert wine and that is dessert and it took five minutes to make and people never fail to really enjoy that as a dessert course if you're going to do three cheeses Mm -hmm. I have two pieces of advice and they're different. (laughs) One is kind of a standard practice to aim for variety on your cheese board. So if you're going to have three, you want to make sure you have some range in the age from young to old, range in textures. You want to have something that's creamy and something that's hard, something that's mild and something that's strong so that there's a little bit of something for everybody. And different kinds of milks can help you with that variety. Cow, goat, sheep, water buffalo, I even tried sometimes to think about visual variety. They have different colors and shapes on my cheese board. Now, having said that, I think it's really fun sometimes to do what the wine people do when they have horizontal tasting Mm -hmm. and they taste Pinots from California and Oregon and uh, France and compare them horizontally. You can do that with cheese too. Why not have a cheddar tasting? Yeah. Have an English cheddar with a Vermont cheddar, with a California cheddar and a Canadian cheddar. Yes. And you will be uh, amazed at the differences, differences. On side by side. So yeah. that's, a, I think, another fun experience is to think about that horizontal tasting as a cheese possibility for your guests. Great idea. Let me go to Lori first. I love truffle cheese. I've had truffle, we call it Truffo up here, or it's a brand name. I'm addicted to it. I need an intervention to get off this stuff, actually. But what's your feeling on truffle or truffle inflected cheeses? Yeah, I don't know that specific one you mean. But we do see a number of truffle cheeses here in the States, usually at holiday time. Uh We see more of them. Yeah. I like some more than others. I think I like that truffle character to be muted, to be more subtle. I tend to prefer it with cow's milk cheeses as okay. opposed to goat's milk cheeses. I just think those mushroomy f- more flavors are more compatible with the buttery notes you get out of cow's milk. So yeah. if I'm going to have a truffle cheese, I'm probably going to look for a cow's milk one. The one that comes to mind that I think is just reliable and well-made and widely available is Soto Cenere from Italy, from Northern Italy. It's a okay. cow's milk a truffle cheese. I've actually visited the creamery and I know they use real truffles. I saw them go into the vat. Nice. So I know they're not using truffle oil, uh, which to me yeah. is just so easy to overuse. Yeah. But there's another one from Italy that's very appealing, even though I just said I don't normally like it with goat's milk. It's a little, <laughs> it's a little goat's milk cheese called Caprino Cremoso. It's just a couple of weeks old probably when it gets here and they just put like a little truffle on top. And so it's very subtle. And that's a pretty little cheese. That's nice. Real truffles, like using real oak barrels as opposed to oak chips. Absolutely. (laughs) So many parallels. Yeah. I mean, you can probably tell the difference. You're a wine authority. You can tell when they've used oak chips. And I can usually tell when they've used truffle oil. (laughs) It (laughs) it takes it over the top. Ketchup. (laughs) Yeah. The vast majority of truffle oil is not made with real truffles. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Amory Chivers, what about goat's cheese with sparkling? I would think that would work, a fresh cheese with sparkling. 
Yeah, actually, I even like the more mature goat cheeses okay. with sparkling wines. I served one yesterday in my class. It was like a six-month aged goat cheese. And when those cheeses are aged that long, they get more caramel notes. They get nutty. Yeah. They turn from white to ivory. They get hard, of course, and they develop these nutty notes like dulce de leche, if you've ever had that. When you take goat's milk and you cook it down and down and down and down, it gets caramel-like. And that's what happens to these cheeses. Goat goudas have that caramel note that can be really nice with sparkling wine. Yeah, why not? You know, sure, goat cheeses with a fresh creamy goat cheese with sparkling wine can be very, very pleasing way to start a meal. What I like to do with those really simple goat cheeses that don't have a rind on them. I'll put them in a little ramekin and put some good olive oil on them, crack some black pepper on top, maybe lay a thyme sprig on top and then put them in an oven just until they warm up and they, they'll start to quiver. I'm not trying to melt them. And then they become even more spreadable and just compelling. You just have to have a crostini to spread that warm goat cheese on. And that is a great uh, appetizer. Very compelling. And Anne-Marie says, I'm so hungry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, this has flown by so fast, Janet. Let's make sure we've covered everything. Is there the best piece of advice you can give or you've received when it comes to pairing wine and cheese? Well, we've touched on this a little bit. You go with your own palate. If it doesn't taste good to you, it's not a good match. What I'm really trying to do when I think about wine and cheese pairing, I'm trying to protect the wine because in my experience, the wine rarely makes the cheese taste better or worse, but the cheese can make the wine taste better or worse. I'm really trying not to have a pairing where the cheese makes the wine taste worse. Presumably I'm serving a wine I like. So I want cheese that either leaves the wine kind of neutral, unchanged, or brings out some, you know, heightens the aroma. So you just have to be wary of, I guess if I have one fundamental guideline, it's to try to match up intensities. You do this with all food and wine pairing, and it's same with cheese and wine pairing. You want light with light and richer or bolder with richer, bolder wines. So lighter, younger, fresher cheeses, I tend to put with lighter, younger, fresher wines. And as the cheese moves up in age and intensity and pungency, then I want a wine that's um, bigger, stronger, older. Makes total sense. Now, Janet, you had mentioned you have a recipe. Maybe tell us about the recipe and where folks can contact you. Sure. Well, I thought of it because we were talking about sparkling wine and cheese. And one of my favorite things, and it's a holiday time and one of my favorite appetizers year round, but especially now with sparkling wine is Gougere, which is the little French, it's like a little French cream puff, but it doesn't have a filling. It's savory and it's made with a cream puff batter, but it's got some cheese in it. I usually use Gruyere and a local Napa chef gave me her recipe. Hers are the best I've ever had. And she gave me her recipe last year. I put it in my blog, Planet Cheese. Or if they go to planetcheese.org, they can sign up for my newsletter that way. I'm going to do that. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> you won't. It's easy and it's oh. fail-proof. Oh, and it's the holidays. I can't wait to do this for somebody. <laughs> and yeah, I don't even they cook. freeze well, too. You can stick them oh. in the freezer and, and then just pop them in the oven when guests come over. So, so great. Nice recipe to have. Oh, yeah. Janet, this is fantastic. What a great chat we've had. I really appreciate you taking the time and some great tips here. Janet, I wish you all the best with your courses, your books, and so on. And and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Natalie. It's been my pleasure. Okay, take care. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Janet Fletcher. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I love Janet's advice that simplicity is often the key to a great cheese board. Let the cheese be the star both visually and flavor-wise, rather than a lot of condiments. Two, when it comes to condiments, many can clash with your wine, whether they're sweet, vinegary, or pickled. The same goes with bread and crackers, so it's best to stick to fairly neutral flavors. Three, I can't wait to experiment more with sherry and cheeses, especially an aged Gouda with those nutty butterscotch flavors. 
Four, I found it interesting that triple cream cheeses are about 75% butterfat, and of course that's the dry matter without water, versus 62% for double cream cheeses and 45% on average for most cheeses. Five, it's interesting how our perception of the salt in cheese increases as it ages and loses moisture, although of course that makes sense. Six, Janet has great advice for chipping rather than cutting hard cheeses to maintain their crunchy crystalline structure. You can see the special knife she recommends in the video version of our conversation, which you'll find in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 105. You'll also find links to the wines and cheeses we tasted there, where you can find me on Facebook Live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m., including tonight if you're listening to this podcast on the day it's published, and how you can join me in a free online food and wine pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 105. You won't want to miss next week when I'm chatting with Joel Gott, who purchased a few tons of Zinfandel back in 1996, and with the help of his then-girlfriend, now wife, and winemaker at Joseph Phelps, Sarah produced his first vintage of wine. It received wide praise from critics, which was all the encouragement he needed to produce additional veritals. He joins me from his winery and home in Napa Valley next week. In the meantime, if you missed episode 53 with the Globe and Mail's Christine Sismondo, go back and take a listen. We chat about festive wines, spirits, and mixed drinks for the holidays. She tells some fascinating stories about the drinks, too. I'll share a clip with you now to whet your appetite. The flavor of Franciacorta, again, drives me right to it every single time. I think it's just a really elegant... You know, I don't want to compare it to champagne because I believe that they should be all judged according to their own standards. But of course, it is in that direction in that it's dry. The bubbles are really fine. The flavor is really elegant and perfect. And the Glera grape to me has a little bit of sweetness that I find a little less palatable than the grape mix that's being used for French Accorta. And Glera being the grape used for Prosecco. So why is Frankie Corda then more expensive? You're alluding to it, but are there some core things that they do making Frankie Corda that do add cost to the process? So as I understand it, not all Prosecco is Charmat method, but the vast majority of it is. So there are some exceptions to that. Whereas with the French Accorda, there is no Charmat being used whatsoever. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wine and cheese tips that Janet Fletcher shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a sherry that pairs perfectly with a mature Gouda. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.